All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. I think I know most of you. Uh, I'm Scott Ballard, and I am the department chair of the Lynn Benton Community College Non-Destructive Testing Department and Program. And I'm hoping my, uh, my buddy Zach joins us pretty soon. And uh, we have Emily Whittier uh, on here, I see. And uh, Emily is uh, our instructional specialist, and she's a level two radiographer, uh, currently working at Pacific CAS in Albany. Uh, Emily brings us about 15 years of, uh, of industrial radiography experience and has been a wonderful addition to our staff. Our staff. And, uh, oh, surprise, by the way, Emily, I think I'm going to have you teach a class next term. This seems like the appropriate place to tell you. So, uh, anyway, um, anyway uh, our program's going, is going well. And uh, so I've been here, this is my fifth year at Lynn Benton Community College. And prior to that, I was a high school manufacturing teacher for 22 years. And prior to that, I got a degree in uh, metallurgy and material science in 1991. And I mostly actually worked as a welder, was really my trade experience. And then I went on and got a, a education degrees at Western Oregon and, and was a teacher for a long time. So that's kind of what uh, brings me here. Um, talk a little bit about our program. Uh, so this program existed in a kind of a different form. It was a, a metallurgy program, which was included destructive testing, uh, material science, uh, quite a bit of material science, and, uh, and included non-destructive testing. So when we say non-destructive testing, we're talking about um, testing parts uh, without destroying them. So if it's uh, an airplane component, a jet engine component, uh, we're going to, uh, it's going to be x-ray, dye penetrant inspection, sometimes ultrasonic inspection, and, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, the integrity of the part is such that it's going to stay in the sky and not fail and cause airplanes to crash. Uh, that's really the, the ultimate end game there. Um, the program went away uh, in 2013, I think, or 12. And, uh, and then local industry was crying for people to be trained because there were none. And so fast forward to uh, five years ago, and they they kind of reinvented this program and brought it back as a, a full non-destructive testing uh, technical training facility. So uh, our facility here at Lynn Bank Community College is, is probably, it's the premier facility on the West Coast of our country. And it's one of the top two or three programs, um, period. Uh, we have good staff um, and uh, our job placement has been outstanding. Um, our students have, have done really well getting jobs both locally and regionally. And some have even traveled the world a little bit uh, to get jobs as aerospace inspectors, uh, weld inspectors, uh, bridge construction inspectors, and the petrochemical industry. I've got a couple of students working up in Alaska on the pipelines now and, uh, and down in, uh, in the Houston area as well. So that's kind of a, a shotgun approach to what we're here for and what we're about. What I'd really like to do is I'd like to answer any specific questions uh, that you all might have about anything to do with the program. Don't everybody jump at once. Well, that was easier than I thought. Um, do we have any students on here? I suppose you have one. Say that again. I suppose you have one. Ah, so are you Shiloh? Is that your name? Yes. Hi, Shiloh. Where are you from? I'm from Independence. Okay. Are you at Central High School? Um, I'm at um, Sandy Am Christian. Right on. So do you have any questions for me, Shiloh, about uh, the program or even career technical education in general? I'm fairly well versed in that topic. Oh, um, I went to a welding class and so I did have some experience with non-destructive testing. Okay. Which was useful. So Shiloh, what grade are you in? Um, 12th. Right on. So uh, 
where do you see yourself? What are you, what are your, your plans for your future going forward? I'd like to go into the military. I am not um, eligible to apply for the military until September of 2022. Okay. So I'm looking for something to, um, to do after I, um, after I um, graduate from high school and before I start the, the military. Great. Well, then you should come join the non-destructive testing program. It'd be a perfect fit for you. You could go right in. You'd have a skill set. Probably yeah. have to do less push-ups when you got in there. It'd be mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, if you if if you're interested um, after today, if you have questions, we have a lot of good programs here at the college. You know, we have mechatronics, our machine tool program, our welding program, um, and and the non-destructive testing here, all on our main campus. Pretty pretty solid programs. If you have questions or you're interested in looking further into it, then I'd be happy to spend some time uh, talking with you about that, Shiloh. Okay. Scott, I have a question for you. I'm ready. Can you, um, I, I've been, I hear like when Emily is speaking tomorrow, I hear, I, I hear them talk about, I hear people in the field talk about level one, level two, or level three certifications. Can you talk about how that relates to your program? Like what do students who do the two years, what do they get and what does that sort of face? get them as far as where they can work and what kind of companies they can work for? Yeah, I can address that, Chris. So particularly the aerospace and the petrochemical industries are, are very, very regulated for all the obvious reasons. And, um, and so our program, our curriculum is very tightly aligned with the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing and as per TC1A guidelines. And in addition to that, we adhere to the uh, NAS 410, which is the National Aer Aeronautics Society um, Code 410, because those are the standards that our aerospace industries primarily uh, adhere to. And what that means is when students come through our program, uh, there's a minimum number of classroom hours and a min minimum number of on the job training hours that you have to have before you are, are qualified and certified to inspect an airplane part. Um, and, and so when students, if a student goes through our, our two year Associate of Applied Science program, when they're done, they will have received the level one and level two classroom hours for um, radiation safety and health training, uh, radiography level one, radiography level two, um, ultrasonics level one, ultrasonics level two, uh, liquid penetrant level one and level two, and magnetic particle inspection level one and two, visual inspection level one and two. And what that means is when you go to industry, they're like, oh, you've had the classroom hours, you have a lot of experience, we're gonna train you on our equipment because our x-ray cabinet is probably different than the one that you learned at school. And when you receive your level one qualifications of all the hours and all the tests that you take, it says that you can set up this machine and you can test a part. That's what a level one says. You're qualified to do that. To be a level two, you can set up the inspection equipment. You can follow an ASTM or ASNE or American Welding Society specification and procedure. And at that point you accept and reject parts. So if you're a level two, you have a little signet ring, a stamp, and uh, Emily is on here somewhere and you know, she's got a stamp to her name. So when she signs her name and she says that this uh, titanium fan frame is, is defect free, uh, that paperwork follows that. It's like a birth certificate and that folder follows that to Boeing or Airbus or wherever it goes. And if that part fails and they trace it back to Emily and say, hey, you stamped off on this with your signet ring and you said this that's her problem 
So yeah, so it's, it's a big deal. So if you're a level one, you test parts. If you're a level two, you can accept and reject parts. And that means you get paid a lot more. And, uh, and then a level three is an individual, often they're engineers, not always. And they work with their technicians and the customer, the customer being US government, um, Airbus, Boeing, uh, the Air Force. And they decide how are we going to set up the testing for this part? What are the procedures and what requirements are we going to adhere to? Whether it's ASTM specifications, uh, ANSI standards, et cetera. Um, and that's- uh, I assume that takes a whole lot more experience and, and time. Yeah. What are the time commitments for each of these levels? Good question. It can be anywhere from uh, 20 classroom hours for visual inspection plus 420 hours of on the job to if you're going to be a level two radiographer, it's going to be a little over or just under 2000 hours of industry experience and 80 hours of classroom training. And you take a practical test, a general knowledge test and a specifications a specific exam. And you have to pass those exams with an 80% composite score. So if you score less than an 80%, you are not qualified and certified. So there you go, Chris, that was a long answer. To a are you able to retake those tests? Pardon? Are you able to retake those tests? Good question. If you fail a test, there's a 30 day waiting period and then you can take the test again. Now, if you're working for a company, at some point they're gonna say, I don't think this person's gonna pass this test and it's not worth our investment and you're probably gonna get moved on. One of the things that we do here at the college is we teach to that test. We are training you how to take tests and we're training you uh, for the type of test questions because we want you to be successful and, and go on. So that's, that's a huge part of our job. Other questions? I have another one, Scott. I'm ready. Can you describe, um, you mentioned in your talk, can you just describe a little bit more about the, the types of inspection so that there's the dye penetrant and then there's the visual. Can you briefly go into each version that you guys teach? Yes. And those please. So everything starts with visual inspection, visual testing with our eyes. And, um, and we use tools, measurement tools, uh, uh, calipers, scales, micrometers, uh, lights, mirrors, magnifying glasses. And this is all of course to a standard. So that's visual inspection. And then everything after that still falls back on visual. So then liquid penetrant inspection or dye penetrant inspection is really a, you're, you're, a, you're looking for surface indications and flaws that you can't see with the naked eye. So you're gonna enhance that by putting uh, a dye that penetrates. It's got a very, very low surface tension and it'll penetrate into the cracks and crevices. You wipe it clean, it looks very clean, and you spray a developer, think like baby powder, and then capillary action bleeds some of that back out, and you can enhance your visual inspection of surface indications and or defects and evaluate the part. Another surface um, indication inspection process is magnetic particle inspection which really only works with materials that are magnetic, which primarily are uh, iron, cobalt, and nickel. And so we're not, we're not talking aerospace, we're not talking aluminum or titanium, uh, but bridge building and, and pipe welding, they do a lot of magnetic particle inspection. And if there's a, a, a crack, an edge crack, a crater crack, a surface crack in the weld, uh, you'll detect it. And that's where most of the magnetic particle inspection occurs. The next procedure um, is ultrasonic inspection. And so within ultrasonic, so everybody here, uh, you know, is familiar with ultrasonic on the medical side. Uh, when my wife had our, our kids, our babies, uh, she had ultrasounds and they are able to use a sound wave, which refracts differently with every density of medium. And this is a volumetric uh, inspection. So we're inspecting the full volume of the part, not the surface, but really what's inside. 
And uh, not unlike having a medical ultrasonic examination, uh, when you have, uh, we're gonna look inside of a part, a casting, um, an aerospace part uh, with ultrasonics, and we can see if there's a void or a chunk of sand or a crack that would cause it to fail in service. Um, and within ultrasonics, we can do uh, a couple of different styles. We have immersion testing, where we immerse in water. Sound does not travel very efficiently through air, but uh, ultrasound travels very well through water and other uh, mediums. And then uh, radiographic inspection. Again, if you think you got a fractured arm, you go get an x-ray and you try to see if you can find a hairline fracture uh, inside your arm. And that's really what we're doing. Uh, it's a volumetric inspection process where we look inside of the bridge beam, we look inside of the structural members, and we're uh, looking for discontinuities. If it's a weld inspection, we'll be looking for weld flaws, uh, porosity, lack of fusion. All those things will show up because it's a differentiation of density. So the density of a chunk of sand or slag is much different than the density of the steel, the parent material, and you can, you can differentiate that. You see it on, on the x-ray uh, image, the radiograph. And we do digital, we do film, and we do computed radiography, and our equipment is uh, the latest and the greatest uh, brand new uh, technology that we have, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Another question. Um, due to the nature of having to learn how to um, test these parts, do you also need to learn how to build some of the parts as well in order to understand what you're looking for? Learn how to, would you, would you repeat that please? Like, um, let's say with welding, you need to learn how to weld as well as to learn how to, to find defects in it. Yeah, you're, you're right on Shiloh. So part of our program is you're gonna take some welding classes so you understand the basics of welding. You're gonna take a blueprint reading class so you can read a set of blueprints and plans. Uh, you're going to take a machining class, a machine tool. You're not going to be a machinist or a welder, but you're going to know the process and understand how defects might occur so you can effectively inspect the parts. Good question. Great question, Shiloh. Scott, I have another question um, regarding math. Um, when I would bring students to visit your program, um, you know, I'd hear them talk amongst themselves and a lot, of, a lot of people, adults included, are intimidated by math. Can you talk about how the math is taught for um, doing this work in your program? Yes, so uh, the math is, you know, it's fairly technical math. Um, you know, if you're talking visual inspection, it might be just some general, uh, some general volumetric inspection where I need to check the perimeter and, and circumference and radius, and it's pretty, pretty ah, straight volume. But um, when we're looking at, uh, say, radiation safety, which is a class that I teach, uh, we use the inverse square law. Um, the inverse square law is what helps us determine the safe distance from a radiation source, whether it's a gamma radiation source or an X radiation source. <clears throat> and so uh, we do some math there. Uh, ultrasonics is very technical. Uh, we have probably eight to 12 trigonometric tri trig, uh, uh, functions that we use, and they're kind of complex, but we do them over and over again, and we're doing this math to solve a problem. And so when we do Snell's law, which tells us uh, what angle uh, a sound beam refracts at, and when it goes through water, it refracts differently than when it goes through titanium, and it goes differently through titanium than it does aluminum. So we need to know where our sound is if we're gonna, if we, if we wanna know where our indications are on the part. So we have math equations that we do, and we have software that does some of the math for us. But in order to get certified, you have to do that math. So if you have a strong, you know, we want people to be pretty strong in basic algebra, and then we're gonna teach you the math in the class. Uh, you could not have taken a trig class and I'm gonna teach you sine and cosine. You don't have to prove it. I don't care that you know why sine and cosine works, but you need to know how to manipulate the equation so you can get the right answers. And that's, that's what we teach too. 
Thanks, Scott. Anyone else, f feel free to unmute and ask Scott a question. Uh, Scott, can you describe a little bit what it's like in your classroom? Are you, you know, what, what, what your day looks like, um, both now and, and under regular circumstances? Like how much time is spent with the machinery, hands-on, how much is sitting in a chair? Yeah, Trista. Um, so pretty much all of our classes are lecture lab classes. And I think our other programs are similar. Our welding department uh, is like that, where you're gonna spend some time going over theory. And so the way we do it, um, and really it's not that different on the pandemic than it is you know, pre-COVID. Uh, the delivery is different, right? So we're doing our lectures on Zoom and the dissemination of information, technical information, your reading assignments, your quizzes. And then we take, and our goal is, you know, kind of, you know, learning theory 101, the closer that I, that I partner the hands-on activity to the theory, uh, the better you're going to learn it. And so if I'm going to teach on a concept on Monday, my goal is that we, that we back that up on Tuesday with a lab and get our hands on it. So for instance, this week, my visual inspection students did some activities and worksheets on um, dial calipers and how the calipers work and some interactive software that's out there that's, I think, pretty good uh, to use. And then we came in and everybody gets calipers and we go through them and we learn how to read to the 1,000th of an inch and actually measure a part and record it correctly. Um, so I would say we're probably we're probably 40% lecture, 60% lab. Uh, we try pretty hard to get our hands on it. And of course, there's, there's conversation and the robust teaching, in my opinion, occurs in the lab. That's where you're really learning uh, to, to apply the theory to the practice um, and the profession. Uh, so that's kind of a... Uh, uh, a 40, 60 kind of a number. Does that, does that answer your question, Trista? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Scott, I've got a question for you. So, um, you know, a lot of young women may not be aware of opportunities in manufacturing or trades, or they might think that those jobs are better fits for men. What do you say or what might you say to encourage a young woman to pursue these fields too um so that's a that's a great question sarah and um when i was a high school in instructor um one of the things that i actually received an award for was i had the highest number of non-trads uh, for a high school manufacturing program and the non-trads uh, for us were women right and, uh, and I worked pretty hard at that. And I had a lot of different strategies at the high school level. Here, um, the proof is in the pudding. And one of the things I tell um, our students, we have several female students in our program. I think we have five or six right now, ladies in the program. Um, and if Emily is still on, so Emily is a radiographer. Emily is paid very well in industry. And I don't know the answer why this is, but in our local industry, so at ATI, Millersburg, Pacific Cast, uh, Selma, and uh, uh, Tie Squared, I'm going to say that pretty close to 50%, if not more, of the radiographers are women. I don't know why that is. Uh, it's an interesting anomaly, actually. But there's a lot of women radiographers. And there's a lot of women, um, if you look at the trades, when I say the trades, if you look at electronics, uh, engineering, uh, techs, uh, welders, machinists, and, and, and mechanics, uh, NDT is probably the highest population of women working. Um, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that that, that, that I won't go into. But I try to recruit uh, when we do our middle school activities here and we do the kind of the recruiting and the outreach, which I've done with Chris for a few years now and, and others. Um, we've had, you know, uh, uh, the middle school girls only nights that we've done before. 
And it's nice for us to have Emily here because she's, she's a lady who's been very successful uh, in the trades and uh, that this is a real thing that you don't have to be a guy to do this work. This is not, has nothing to do with, you know, what color your hair is, what color your skin is, or whether you're a, you're a man or a woman. Um, it's technical. It's probably a little more academic than some of the other trades. Um, and you have to use your head. And uh, if you're willing to work hard, uh, you can make a great living and uh, you can make uh, a really good living at it. And so that's kind of my spiel. Thanks, Scott. That's helpful. Oh, Scott, how much homework is there? How much can I relegate the homework to in class? Good I've question. had an extreme difficulty with um, with doing any form of work at home. If I go somewhere else, I'm fine. But when it's at home, it's very difficult. So my personal philosophy is and has been that we have a lot of time built into our program and that if you're an efficient student and you use your time well, you should get 90% of your work done either in our lab time that we have allocated and or in our classroom time that we have allocated. The outlier there is you're probably gonna, you're gonna need to study um, on your, an additional time. You're gonna need to spend time studying vocabulary, uh, math equations, and really studying for the test. That's the part that uh, I would say it would be homework. Uh, as far as just busy work homework, you know, our classes are pretty robust. And again, most of the work can get done in the time that we have allocated, Shiloh. That's our, that's our game plan. But yeah, there's always going to be some homework um, and it's how much you study. And some of us need to study more than others. We're not all, um, you know, I have to study a lot for a test because I'm old and my brain doesn't work very well. Uh, I've got some some young students that are sharp and they hear it once and they've got it and they don't need to study it. But most of us, that's not the case. You need to plan for, you know, four or five hours a week of studying. So another question is, um, you we're talking about the difference between um, classwork and um, and in-person machining. Um, how much um, 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 I want to say technical or um, I'll call it book knowledge that is required rather than um, in person experience. So if you're going to be a non-destructive testing technician, there's, it's interesting because probably 80% of the work that you're going to do is going to be hands-on work in the field. But the problem our industry partners have is when they hire people that have not been formally trained, they still have to take the certification tests to be able to do the work. And the tests are very hard and they're very academic and you need to have some good test taking skills. And our program, we work really hard at, at preparing you for that. And it is a component. Um, I'm sure if Emily were still on here, she would say 80% of her work is setting up shots and setting up her radiographs and interpreting the information. But she doesn't get to do that job until she passes a written exam, a knowledge-based written exam, uh, a specific examination and a practical, and she has to pass all of those with an 80% or higher. So it's, it's essential, um, the academic piece. You can't, you can't not have it. Another question. You said a written exam. Are you talking about like essays or like... Um... It's a 40 question multiple choice exam. Okay, that sounds actually rather easy instead of something that's an essay or a, or a, here's this topic, explain what, what this is supposed to be. Right, yeah, well, some of those, uh, when you have 
seven or eight choices and there are two paragraphs that each some of those multiple choices are are actually pretty challenging but yeah i agree with you uh, also one more thing is it timed uh yes and they're not the same for every test good question shiloh uh there's a question in the chat here from tiffany tiffany if you want to pop on and ask Sure. Hi, Scott. Uh, I was just curious, you mentioned level three technicians are often uh, engineers. I was curious if there's an area of engineering that was best for that or most common. So an area of engineering, um, it depends on the field. Uh, so probably about half of the level threes are also engineers, but that's not true of all of them. So it really depends it depends on um, on the field. Chemical engineers in in uh, chemical plants are often end up working as as higher levels. But most, I don't, I don't know if there's if there's a if there's a set uh, degree plan for that. I don't know what it is. Okay. Thanks. I'm waiting to be heckled by uh, Dave Becker. I see he, he dropped in for us. So Tiffany, just to touch on your, on your question a little better. So there's not a lot of level threes out there. I mean, if you have a, like at ATI Millersburg, I think there's probably one or two level threes in that whole facility. Um, and so, and I think often what happens is people that make great technicians and level twos, you know, the, the level three is, an, is administrative, you're administering and that's a, sometimes a very different skill set. And it's why uh, many of them often end up being engineers is because they, they tend to have the skill set to fit that uh, requirement, but it's, it's, not, it's not a requirement that they be an engineer. Okay, thanks. Steve has a question. Um, do you want to ask that, Steve, or do you want me to ask it? I see it. Hey, uh, if I were to get burned out in my current position and wanted to try my hand at NDT, provided I could meet the rigor of the field, which is, is questionable, what kind of starting wages would I be looking at? I think, you know, I th typically, if you're willing to travel, you're going to make about 50% more. Uh, and uh, here locally, our students that are getting hired as uh, entry level, level one technicians are about 18 to $21 an hour is, is where I see them starting. Um, most of them have fast tracks to a level two. When I say fast tracked, if you get hired off the street with no NDT degree or experience, probably going to take you five to seven years at least to get to a level two and it could be penetrant mag particle um it's going to be a while most of our students have made it in about a year and then that salary jumps significantly for anywhere from 22 to 40 dollars an hour it really depends on where you're at it's a it's quite a there's quite a a wage variation depending on what company and what field that you're in In Stewardstown, New Hampshire, conservation Chris Egan pulls over two ATVs. Well, you'd be getting paid a whole lot better than I'm currently paid. So I see a question from uh, Dave Becker. Can you get a job without the two year degree, but by taking some core courses, et cetera? And the answer is yes, you could. Um, I've had some students come in 
who had other degrees and uh, they, they were able to uh, get their classroom hours and certification in a specific area. And, uh, and, and we have students now, we have a, a guy now who's a certified weld inspector. He's out of the union shop uh, in uh, Tualatin and he's coming down to take uh, an advanced ultrasonics class. Um, he's not in the program per se. And, uh, and yeah, absolutely, there, there are jobs out there. Um, the more well-rounded you are, especially if you're a young person, the more you're gonna climb and have ability to move laterally and make more money. And the more narrow your education is, your opportunities will be less. And so that's one of the, the selling points of getting the full uh, non-destructive testing uh, degree is you're, you're pretty versatile for a company to use. And Scott, how many people, how many students can you bring into the program every year? Uh, we've capped it at 20. And last year we, we, we filled up and we turned away, I think, 13 people. This year uh, we're not full. I think, you know, COVID has scared some people off. We're going to accept some more students winter term. And I think at winter term we'll be pretty close to full um, at that point. But 20 is our, our current max, and we're hoping that we can accommodate that a little better um, in the future. We just need to add staff, basically. Sarah threw a question into the chat for you. Yeah, equipment. Um, so in our lab, we have a dye penetrant inspection line. We pretty complicated magnetic particle inspection equipment that will train you uh, very directly to go to work in uh, some of our, our regional industries. Uh, we have, I think, 13 ultrasonic inspection units, so we can run a full class uh, where, where there's probably uh, maybe a few people sharing an instrument. Those instruments are thirteen to $15,000 each. These are, these are industry standard. Uh, ultrasonic ins inspection instruments. We have an ultrasonic inspection uh, immersion tank that's about 10 feet by 20 feet um, for dropping material in and, and doing a, a, a CNC scan inspection where it's a computer numerical controlled uh, scan of, of, of either many parts or some large parts. Um, and then we have uh, three x-ray cabinets which includes three uh, digital x-ray systems. They all can do film. And then we also have computed radiography. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we are pretty versatile and our equipment is, is outstanding. We have industry partners come here to train and learn how to use equipment and choose what they're gonna buy because we have, uh, we have really nice equipment here in our facility. Thanks, Scott. You are welcome. What other questions you got for me, Chris? Um, Dave Becker's texting me. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's going to heckle you over sell. So, um, but no, I don't have it. I don't think I have anything else. Um, you've covered a lot of the, there've been some really great questions. Anybody else have, have something to ask Scott while we have them here? I guess maybe one thing I can ask is um, what, what uh, I, and I wish Emily was here. Um, yeah, she she texted had to, me. She's having technical difficulties. She's at home and yeah. her computer wrecked on her. So she was not able to get back on. Um, Cause she, she would have been a good person for, to chime in on this too. But uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the aerospace industry the impact on aerospace industry with COVID 
And, and has that had an impact on jobs for uh, people going into testing and radiography? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I still have students working at Selma and Pacific Cast right now, um, but the layoffs have been have been rough. So right now is is pretty rough on our aerospace partners. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the naval shipyards in Bremerton, Washington, came and recruited, and they hired uh, five students this last month, and. Those jobs each start at $65,000 a year with uh, a $6,500 signing bonus for each one of those. And the oldest person of the five, I believe was 21. It was a bunch of 19 and 20 year olds and they're pretty ecstatic. And, uh, and so it's a really, really good job. Um, so there are jobs out there, um, but right here locally with our local partners, it's a tough time. And I've been in pretty close contact with uh, Mark Christman, who is the uh, president, I think is his title, at Selma and Pacific Cast. And I think he feels like we're about another 12 months out from getting kind of back to close to where we were. And where we were is we couldn't make enough students to fill all their jobs. And uh, so our goal is to get back to that uh, sooner than later. But yeah, COVID's definitely had a negative impact on our local industry, no question about it. Thanks, Scott. It's, we've been hearing the same too, so just wanted to see what impact you were seeing on your end. Do you feel that if there is any sort of infrastructure bill passed, by the state or feds, could that help increase some jobs and maybe some variety um, for NDT specifically? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, every bridge component gets inspected, uh, whether it's steel or concrete, and our students are, are very qualified for that. Uh, there's more jobs in Portland right now than we could fill. I have people that graduated in June, uh, Albany is home, they don't want to move to Portland or Clackamas, but every one of them could get a job uh, tomorrow if they chose to go up to Clackamas to our partner up there, Vigor, and another one, uh, a PQS, uh, Project Quality Solutions. They're a, a private contractor and they go out and they contract and they do a bunch of infrastructure work and they're doing, uh, you know, mag particle x-ray and ultrasonic inspection of uh, structural bridge components and and that, that's going to explode because um, we're going to make more bridges because we're going to have to. Right. And I would guess, you know, medical procedures and stuff, equip titanium knees and things like that, or, you know, hip joints or whatever that are done, that's still, that, that has that, has COVID had an effect on that kind of industry, medical parts? You know, I, I I'm going to assume that since we know that, elective surgeries all got put on hold for a month or two that probably that's been slower i'm going to assume but that's going to come back right that's a that's going to be a temporary very blip and one of our industry partners coors tech industries out of malala they make uh prosthetics uh knees joints phalanges shoulders and uh they're one of our one of our partners uh that we've worked with and they're still going but I'm sure it's probably slower. All right. Thanks, Scott. I should have had a song or something ready to sing for you, Chris, just for the filler. You are great. And and we don't have to stay on the whole day. If people are done, you know, a lot of us are in meetings all day like this. So, you know, if we've, if we've gotten through everything, everyone's had their questions and, you know, we can certainly uh, close down a bit early, but, um, but definitely thank you for your time. I, you know, I really enjoy working with you and your team. It's one of my favorite, when we were doing on campus activities is one of my favorite events to come to. Uh, I love how we teamed up and created the little welding and NDT experience. 
so that they would actually go in to weld things and, and then test them in your lab. That was definitely a highlight for all the kids who came and it was usually one of my favorites, even though I didn't try to weld anything yet. But uh, it was all really good. So looking forward to when we can go back to do some of those events. But uh, in the meantime, it's good to see you guys and see what you're doing and that you're still rocking it over there. Well, Chris, I, I appreciate uh, your kind words. And, and one of the things, um, so I don't know, you know, how much interaction any of you folks have with uh, our high school community, but I have reached out as have some of my other colleagues and, and uh, I'm hoping we can get, because we're doing in-person labs now and they've been really successful. Uh, we're doing small groups, small numbers, and our students are pretty excited to actually get to be here and getting their hands on the equipment. So we have some spots available and I would like for all of our seats to be full. And so if you run into any, uh, any high school students, obviously preferably juniors or seniors, uh, seniors would be best. Um, we can, they can come and jump into a class and, uh, you know, and as, you know, Dave Becker kind of alluded to earlier, you could come and take a class and get a certification and you're employable. I don't want my students leaving me for jobs, right? It's not great for the program, but the reality is you're very, very employable as soon as you get a certification that says, I've taken the 40 hours and I've passed this and I can do this. And uh, so I'm hoping to get a few high school students in and interested. Hey, Chris, since this is being recorded and could potentially be uh, reach out to more students, but Shiloh, uh, thank you for your participation and you, you asked some great questions. Uh, I would just like to say, and this, this kind of hurts me because I really like to give Scott a bad time, but you will not find two faculty members who are more supportive of students and their endeavors. And uh, I'll throw Emily in there as well. She is just a delight to work with as well. And so um, when you get into the program, uh, if you're not successful, it's, probably going to be because you're not wanting to be successful because I know Scott and Zach, um, they're master teachers and they're masters at, at their subject area and they like, they like people, they like students and um, you'll have a good time and I, I won't charge you for this Scott, this is freebie so Wow. But I, I mean it with, I, I mean it. It's is this uh, like my formal evaluation. This is recorded, right Chris? Yes, it is recorded. I can send it directly to Mr. Schilling after. Yeah, and I want to copy that. I feel like my life's good. I, I can't, thanks for that, Steve. Seriously, that's nice. And, and we do care. I mean, we're here for students. That's why, that's why we're here, is we're in the business of, of training. Uh, I say young people, but I have at least one student that's older than me, and he's being retrained. And, uh, but we're here to train people to go to work, and it's exciting. It's, that's a fun gig. And I... Uh, I'm pretty blessed to have this job, and I, I mean that sincerely. This is a, a fun place to work, and, and uh, so I appreciate the support. We should hug later, Steve. Got to put a sheet of plastic in between you two. <laughs> right. Did a great job, Scott. Thanks, Chris. I got to run. I got another meeting, but... I um, appreciate this opportunity, this forum, and um, I hope they all go this well because um, this is good stuff and good opportunities for, for students and our community. Have Thanks, a great Steve. day. You too. All right. Well, thanks again. We'll record this and, and get it up so people who couldn't be here in person can attend and uh, appreciate the time. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Chris and Sarah. Thanks a lot for setting this up. Elizabeth, I don't know if we've met. Hi, Elizabeth. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. I don't think thanks. we have. Bye-bye. <laughs> All Bye. right. Take care. Uh, how do I stop it? I can just kick you off. OK, that works. Thank you. I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> You take care. You too. Thanks for taking yeah. part.